Anything worth doing is worth the process of deciding to do it. Anything worth doing is worth the process of deciding to do it. So the, the process really started like eight weeks ago, nine, maybe nine weeks ago, I mean, mid-September um, was when, when the, the decision was laid out, right? Like a, a decision has to be made, something has to, something has to be decided on. And in that moment, when you're hearing some of those things, the first part of my process was go sit and listen. Like absorb it, listen to it. Like process in the moment, but don't be overcomplicate, don't overcomplicate in the moment. Because I mean, maybe you're watching this, you can think about this too. You've had a hard conversation or you're in the middle of a hard conversation and you're thinking about all the reasons to defend or all the reasons to be wrong or the ways to explain yourself out of this. And when you do that, you actually miss the first start of the process, which is actually intaking and hearing everything. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sales Wolves podcast. I am your host, Tyler Harris. I'm Jonathan Parker. And we are the Sales Wolves. Oh. I feel like mine's getting better the more I do it. I'm glad you think that. I do. <laughs> there will be a replay of my past ones, and it will be qualitatively to, demonstrated that on, mine's better. We're going to turn the auto-tune for Jonathan's uh, <laughs> how there. Uh, this is episode 93, and uh, as you can see, Joseph Caldwell has now turned into Jonathan Parker. Better looking um, bald man. Jonathan Parker has been on this podcast before, mm -hmm. uh, but we brought him back, and I think at a perfect time, um, which I think will provide a lot of value for you guys, because Jonathan has recently gone through a big change in his life, big change. Um, made a big leap, um, stepping out uh, of his existing or current, um, his full-time career, into what really was ultimately calling him uh, and his purpose, passion, and, and what he feels uh, that he was called to do. And anytime you're dealing with that type of life decision, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Um, there's uncertainty, there's risk, there's you know excitement, there's a, a whole bag of emotions. And we wanted to bring Jonathan in just to talk about that. And then really wanted to just talk about what this new venture uh, and this new journey that he's going to be on, what that looks like, because I just want people to know about it, because I think it's incredible, um, and wanted to allow this platform to be an area of, to spread awareness of yeah, that so that you. other people know about it. Um, and so let's just kind of start. First, tell everybody a little bit about you, um, just uh, briefly, for those that didn't watch the other, for yeah. those heathens that didn't watch the, people the who, other episode. Who don't regularly keep up with ago. sales wolves. Yeah, I mean, it's really yeah, sad. For the two or three that didn't... <laughs> Listen to the uh, to the first time you were on. Right. Tell them a little bit about you. So uh, we'll try to do it in 90 seconds. Jonathan Parker, I grew up in New England. Um, awesome family. Parents are some of my best friends. I uh, grew up there, went, had one job, went to one school, one church. Uh, it was really just a pretty normal, awesome life. Grew up in a house that uh, really loved Jesus and uh, came down here to go to school. I was going to study to be a youth pastor, which Everyone should be thankful that I did not do that. Uh, but I fell in love with Greenville, and for the last 10 years, have been the, or last seven and a half, almost eight years, been the director of city involvement for Fellowship Greenville, which is a church here in town. Um, and during that time, I've done just a lot of fun things with nonprofits, the city of Greenville, the chamber. But over the last four years, have launched you know what we were side hustles, right? Yeah. And just out of my passion, um, one was um, the art of the conversation, which is what we talked about last time on the Sales Wolves, helping people understand that their conversations are artwork. If you're seeing Jonathan for the first time on this podcast or hearing Jonathan for the first time on this podcast, you need to go back and watch that one. It's on the art of conversation. We'll figure out what episode it is. We'll put it in the comments or something. But it's a ton of value in that uh, episode. So make yeah. sure you go back and watch that. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. No, that's great. Yeah, go back, listen to it. I've got... A lot of content on my YouTube channel and on the social media platforms talking about conversations and been pouring into that, but also... Conversations on conversations. Conversations on conversations. It's like uh, Kramer on Seinfeld when he had the coffee table book about coffee tables. Coffee table, which nowadays would be pretty awesome because people don't have coffee book tables or coffee. That's true. They really don't have coffee tables either. Yeah, that's true. So maybe Kramer was onto something. 
My ADD is on another level. That's great. But I'm the easiest <laughs> guest to have that because we can just keep going. I can ask questions can about that and we can figure out different why, rabbit trails and figure out where we started. Why that happened. So the art of the conversation was one, but the other one, which we haven't spent a lot of time talking about yep. on this on this program before, is I started two gatherings. One was called Gospel on Tap, and the other one was called Hymns and Hops. Gospel on Tap is in its fourth year. Uh, which is a gathering for men to come and have intentional conversations about life and purpose and doubt and the good news about Jesus in a, an ordinary environment, an ordinary place, right uh, downtown Greenville at Barley's. And over the course of you know four, some, or four years, over 150 men have come through that. And then getting ready to celebrate two years, I've started Hymns and Hops, which is a gathering where we sing old hymns and we drink beer or wine or you know nothing at all, uh, soda, water, and I started those two things, and as of uh, 10 days ago, just about 10 days ago, I have stepped full-time into the nonprofit, which is called All Good Things, that oversees both of those gatherings. Uh, married to a beautiful wife. Her name is Jessica. She's remarkable, talented. She's my Wonder Woman. And I have three boys, Titus Jew Design. Titus yesterday turned five. I have a five-year-old. That's crazy. Um, and they're great. And uh, I love those boys. You know, and you know, that's crazy because I can remember stuff when I was five. So that's crazy. Can you? Yeah. I spent so yesterday. Like, I spent yesterday trying to convince my wife that he won't remember his five-year-old birthday party because he was sick. Um, and you remember your five-year-old birthday party, or do you remember what people told you about your five-year-old birthday party? Neither. Okay. <laughs> but, but I remember because I started wrestling when I was five, and I, I remember wrestling practice and like. Okay. Yeah. I okay. Remember when I was five. I remember everything my dad said, for sure. Everything? Especially when I, when he didn't know I was around. Oh, great. Thanks. Every single thing. That's <laughs> great. I'm going to have to go back and watch my own episodes about the conversation. So that's a little bit about me. Did I leave anything out? I've known Tyler for yeah, about four years? Three, three? Three? Three, four years? Yeah, about three. Okay. About that. Yeah. Well, awesome. So let's, let's talk about, first, what type of process did you go through in making this type of decision? Yeah. I know you know you're someone that I would I would think didn't just on a whim come home and say, honey, this is what I decided. <laughs> right. Um, so I know that's part of it is the conversation with her. Yep. Um, but then also your own process. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of people that are listening. There's right. a lot of people that are watching. Um, the goal of a side hustle is for it to have the potential of being something that can yeah, turn into full of time. I mean, that's you know, that's best case scenario. And there's a lot of people that have those mm -hmm. that have the desire for them to turn into something where they could leave a right. full time career and <clears throat> and turn that into a full time uh, opportunity for them. So, you know, what did that look like for you? Like, what was that process, and um, how do you feel about it right now? Because we're ten days in. It's we're super fresh. It's real fresh. Super fresh. Um, I, so I, I've said this before, I think it might have been on one of the other podcasts, but one of the things that I say is anything worth doing is worth the process of deciding to do it. Anything worth doing is worth the process of deciding to do it. So the, the process really started like eight weeks ago, nine, maybe nine weeks ago, I mean mid-September um, was when, when the, the decision was laid out. Right, like a, a decision has to be made. Something has to something has to be decided on. And in that moment, when you're hearing some of those things, the first part of my process was go sit and listen, like absorb it, listen to it, like process in the moment, but don't be overcomplicate. Don't overcomplicate in the moment, because I mean, maybe you're watching this. You can think about this. Two, you've had a hard conversation or you're in the middle of a hard conversation and you're thinking about all the reasons to defend or all the reasons they'd be wrong or the ways to explain yourself out of this. And when you do that, you actually miss the first start of the process, which is actually intaking and hearing everything, right? So you need, the first part of the process was hearing it, but hmm. after I, I heard it, after I heard it, I went and I talked to my wife. And, and I think this is a struggle for guys. You know, and we, we did the, the Modern Man podcast where we talked about why do guys have a hard time sharing their emotions and their mm -hmm. feelings. Yep. I think when it comes to work and side hustle and your job and entrepreneurship and all of that, we have a tendency to talk to everybody else but our spouse sure. and then bring our spouse the answer. Like, hey, I talked to you know, Paul and uh, Jerry and Tyler and they think I should do this, so don't you think I should do that too? <laughs> 
And that generally leaves the spouse out of the process. Yeah. And when anytime you're taking a, a risk like Jessica and I did, anytime we take that step, I mean, I say that all the time, Jessica and I took this. Just yeah. I didn't just take this. Mm-hmm. I didn't just leave a full-time job that had a full-time salary that, right, I didn't do that. Mm-hmm. We did that. Yep. So that, you know, that day, that Tuesday, I canceled meetings that night, right? I had good meetings that night, and I don't like to cancel meetings. But I called everybody, I was like, hey, y'all, I gotta cancel this meeting. Um, I need to go talk to my wife. Like, I was just upfront about it. I need yeah. to go talk to my wife about something. And I laid out everything to Jess, and part of the process with her was I gave no commentary. Hmm. Just facts. Just This is what happened. Because, and you know, not everyone lives with a spouse that wants the best for them, right? You know, sure. so that, I mean, that, that might be part of the tension you're living in. I know my spouse, I know Jessica wants what's best for me, right? And best, for, she's my biggest cheerleader. Uh, she can also be my biggest critic, right? So that's what's a great combination. But I didn't want to give any commentary. I didn't want to flavor anything because I was like, you know, so I don't want to do it or I do want, like that would have flavored. And after she heard everything, and it was difficult, it was challenging, it was hard. She looked me square in the eye and said, well, you need to go do hymns and hops and gospel and tap. Like you need to do it. Like she, like after hearing everything, she, she was so settled, like, yeah, it's time to take this step. It's time to step into this. I was the one that went, hold on, <laughs> back up. You know, so that was the initial part of the process with my wife. And then what I- Did you just get through the pros list? You didn't gotten to I the didn't the cons, gotten to the cons list. <laughs> it's like, we're not even there yet, babe. Um, so then like, I'll, I'll pause there and then say, but here's my personal process. And you bring it up, pros and cons. I had to actually write down. Here are the pros for staying in my full-time job, which was a great job. Yeah. Like, it was a great job. I wasn't running from my job. I wasn't hiding from my job. Uh, it was, an, like, there was a lot of pros to my job, and there were a lot of, there were a lot of cons, right, for any job. Mm-hmm. And then there was a lot of pros for stepping out into this new arena, and there were a lot of cons mm-hmm. to stepping out into it. And we can get to some of those later. And I needed to not just, like, say them or think about them. I needed to write them down. I needed to look at them. Um, and just because... You know, I'm, I, I really like Jesus and I believe I can talk to him. I talked to him about him. I was like, what, like, what do you want, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want me to do? What do you know, think about? And part of the process there was there's difference between being alone and being isolated. I didn't want to isolate myself. Guys have a tendency to isolate themselves. Yeah. Um, but I, I needed some time alone to think, to process, to ponder, to dream. Um, and that took days, like three or four days. Because I, I would go do that, I'd get some time away, um, a, a version of meditation or being in a, a calm place, and then I'd go back and ask again, like, should I do this, should I do this? Um, I didn't want it to be, what's the term, like knee-jerk reaction, I didn't want to be reactionary. I wanted to be responsive, like I had to respond to something, but I didn't want to be reactionary. So it was a lot of thinking, and then, I mean, this might sound weird to some people. I started asking, I started praying about who should I talk to about this? Hmm. Like, because there are some people I could talk to and they're just, they're on my side regardless. Like, yeah, whatever, like, just do it. I needed to talk to some critics. I needed to talk to some people who would disagree with me. So part of the process is not only talking to your your fan base, right? The people who believe, but talk to people who don't. Yeah. Like, get their opinion. Who are the people that think you shouldn't leave your job to do your side hustle full time? Yeah. So, and then I came back and I just regularly checked in with my wife. Like, what are you thinking? Anything change? Any questions you have for me? Um, and, and as we did that process, we walked together in it. We didn't run ahead, no one fell behind. You know, so if you're watching this right now and you've got a big decision to make and you have a good, healthy relationship with your spouse, like, don't, don't run ahead, don't fall back, like, walk, walk with them in mm-hmm. that. Um, because now I can say, without any question, Jessica and I have made this decision. Jessica and I are doing this. Um, we're in it together. So the process took about two, two and a half weeks for Jessica and I. Um, and when people would, people who knew would ask us about it, I would just say, yeah, we're still working through it. We're still in process. Because um, I wasn't going to be pushed. I wasn't going to be pushed yeah. either way. Yeah. Um, which some people could call luxury because some people are pushed out or mm. are running. Um, but... But we weren't going to be pushed either way. We were going to be clear-headed. I kept using a phrase with her, never quit on a bad day, make the decision in the clear light of day. Hmm. Like, never quit on a bad day, always make a decision in the clear light of day. Hmm. And that, that was the time we made the decisions. 
You know, a lot of, I think, the resistance to having these type of conversations with a spouse is, as men, I think we feel a need to provide security. Mm -hmm. And I think anytime there's uncertainty, that's perceived as um, danger. Mm -hmm. And that desire for a spouse to feel safe Mm -hmm. is threatened when all of a sudden you you start opening up and talking about things that are now uncertain. And... So what would you say to someone that, that feels that way? Like, man, I know I need to talk to my spouse about this, but I don't want them, I don't want, I don't want them to worry, basically. Right. Like, I don't want them to worry. I want them to know that I've got everything under control. Right. But that I want to include them in this process. Mm-hmm. So where, where does that, where's the line there? Well, I, I think one of the things to think about is if, so when I was talking to Jess, right, let's just, let's, yeah. we can go philosophical after, let's be practical. I was talking to Jess, I could have come home Tuesday. Let's talk about how I could have done. Mm-hmm. Could have come home Tuesday. And she could have said, how was the conversation? And if my thought was, I need to keep her safe, I need her to know I've settled, I don't want her to feel any uncertainty. And I just said, it was great, it's fine, all yeah. good. Yeah. She's gonna live in perceived settleness, perceived certainty. Mm-hmm. And then in seven days, when when she's been like, oh, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good, I'm now gonna come back and go, oh, by the way, I was protecting you. Mm-hmm. I, but now, here's the, well, okay, wait. I think most spouses mm-hmm. don't wanna live under false pretenses. Sure. So what would have actually created more uncertainty would be not telling her that I was uncertain mm-hmm. because now I'm not uncertain about a situation. Now I've made my spouse, I made Jessica uncertain about me. Mm-hmm. Like. What else are you not keeping from? What else are you keeping from me? Mm-hmm. Can I trust you in this decision? You know, now I've started the journey off on a wrong foot that may never actually be, I may never catch that back up mm-hmm. in this regard. So if you have to make a big decision and you want your spouse to see you as strong, independent, um, conscious, certain, be vulnerable and open about your uncertainties, about mm-hmm. what you're not confident in. I mean, because that first night I told Jess, if we do this, we, we don't have a steady income. Yeah. Like, this is, this is a new type of work. This is work where we need to work in such a way where we raise funds and get supporters and find sponsors. Like, this is, a different, this is a different kind of work. I was like, so if we make this decision, we have to, you have to understand I'm uncertain how I'm gonna put food on the table. Mm-hmm. But what was great about telling her that night one, not night seven, is she was like, mm-hmm. but we're in this together. Mm-hmm. And let me just brag on my wife for a little bit. If you're also worrying about not sharing because you're uncertain or you don't want to be settled. Jessica heard what I was doing and she looked at me and she went, well, if you're getting ready to take that step, I want to take a step and up my business. So in about two weeks, Jessica leveled up. That's awesome. And she was like, listen, if we're in this together, I got to take my business to the next level. Mm -hmm. And she, I mean, she just blew it out of the water and she went and took tests and got certified for things. And she was at the top of her class and now her business is ready to take off. Mm -hmm. So, so sharing that vulnerable and transparent, yeah. like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Her response was, no, you're not going to have to, we're going to do this. Yeah. So if you're watching that and you're there, just realize you're actually going to, you're going to connect more and be more cohesive and moving forward. If you just are always, always laying it out honestly and vulnerably. That's huge. So let's talk about now. Let's talk about um, the future and yeah. what the future holds and kind of where you're at. And then tell everybody a little bit more about these actual events, because cool. you know, to say that they're um, you know just a couple of gatherings, you know, <laughs> it's it's more than just a couple of gatherings. Yeah. Like this is something that has grown into its, it's got a life of its own, right? Um, <clears throat> and it's remarkable um, in any facet to to get groups of people together mm-hmm. for anything, right? Uh, like the like the number of people that you're getting together. So maybe give people a little bit more details about exactly what these. Um, gatherings are, yeah. uh, and then what now kind of the overarching umbrella over it is and where you're going with it. That's great. So let's start with Gospel and Tap. So Gospel yeah. and Tap is a gathering uh, uh, geared towards guys, towards mm-hmm. men. Not that I don't want women to have gatherings, mm-hmm. um, but I'm not a woman, so I don't know what a gathering for them should look like. Sure. But the other piece is guys just have a hard time having conversations. So I started Gospel on Tap, and Gospel on Tap is is geared towards, well, let me say it this way. Both of these gatherings, Gospel on Tap and Hymns and Hops, are geared towards unconventional ways of thinking about 
having conversations about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this is unconventional. So if you're watching this and you grew up in a church, you grew up with a religious background, um, and you are like, wait, you talk about Jesus and gospel stuff over beers? Yes. So some of you just need to take that in, right? This is <laughs> unconventional. Um, we meet in normal spaces, just everyday spots. Um, we don't have brick and mortar. I'm not saying we never will, but the point is to be in the community. Yeah. So Gospel on Tap meets at Barley's Tap Room downtown, and Barley's has been awesome. Some of the best pizza in town. You should go there. Mm. They've just been remarkable. And this is a place for guys to come, and we leave dogma and judgment at the door and embrace vulnerability and transparency at the table. And this is a place for guys not to be their job title, not to be their income, not to be their upbringing, not to be their background, but to be who they are and wrestle through aspects of their faith and of their life so that they can, they can one, get it out, and two, that they can receive feedback from people who have no reason to lie to them. Sure. Right? So you sign up, you pay money, like guys pay money to be at this table. And when you sign up for that, guys want you to be all in and all there. Mm. So the Gospel on Tap's pretty simple. It's two hours, 6.30 to 8.30. We meet on Monday and Wednesday nights. Right now in Greenville, we'll probably expand that. Is um, the same group or those are two different groups? groups right. Yeah. So you sign up for a Monday group or you can sign up for a Wednesday yeah. group. And when you sign up, the guys are put at a table fairly randomly and they're with the same guys for all eight weeks. Mm. Um, so they're at, they get to know those guys deeply quickly. Yeah. So you can sign up for a Monday night session, which goes eight weeks straight. And you sit at the same table or Wednesday, you go eight weeks straight. And during those eight weeks, when you arrive at the table, um, you answer five questions, five questions I've used here, five questions I've used everywhere. High, low, learn, fail, ask. What's the high of your week? What's the low of your week? What have you learned this week? This is a huge one. What have you felt this week? Hmm. And ask, what can we pray for you this week? Hmm. And for most of our guys, for most of the men who go through Gospel on Tap, especially the first time, they haven't been that open and honest with anyone, let alone a fairly group of strangers mm -hmm. in years. Wow. And then to talk about your feelings, <laughs> talk about your feeling, like, what do you mean how I felt? Like, what are you feeling right now? <laughs> Anxious. <laughs> like, I don't like this. <laughs> awesome. Right. But to be able to share, but by the week, by week three, by week four, guys are crying with one another. Guys mm -hmm. are sharing and caring for one another. And then they get to the ask, what can we pray for you this week? And then a guy, like, it's very practical. Then a guy to your right or left prays for you if they feel comfortable. Yeah. We have guys that say, no, I'm not praying this week. I'm not in a good space. Okay, that's fine. Next guy. Mm -hmm. But these guys get prayed for in a public setting, mm -hmm. right? Barley's Tap Room and Craft Beer, like in a public setting. They get prayed for eight, eight straight weeks. Wow. And that's really this, that's what is so beneficial about Gospel on Tap is it's intentional time that they've set aside to be able to do that. And then the second part, the second hour, you know, we don't rush that part. So mm -hmm. sometimes I can go 45 minutes, I can go an hour and a half, right? Depending mm -hmm. on where the guys are. The second part is we've written content just for the men of Gospel on Tap that deal with topics that men run into all the time. Mm. Purpose, passions, doubt, relationship, work, uh, rela um, being married, mm. raising kids, um, entrepreneur, like just stuff guys wrestle with. Sure. But we do that in such a way that we want to take the topic and then see it through the lens of the good news about Jesus. Like we believe that the gospel is good news about Jesus and about everything else. Like we just believe that. Mm -hmm. So what does a topic of like purpose or doubt have to do with Jesus? So we write content for them, but the content's just a vehicle to get to the questions. And at the end, we always have questions and there's no table leader. There's like a host, hmm. but men lead men, right? So yeah. this is a gathering where no one has uh, all the answers, right? There's not a guy up there pontificating <laughs> like, this is what you should think and believe. Nope, you're at a table <laughs> with guys wrestling through the same thing. Um, and then what happens after the guys go through that on Fridays, we have what we call the chaser, um, which is, so if you know what a chaser is, it's what you <laughs> throw back to help ease, ease whatever else you, mm -hmm. you know, took a shot of the first time. So if gospel on tap is this really intense gospel presence, mm -hmm. the chaser is what helps it go down. And what we believe that is, is just truths from the Bible. Yeah. And that's the Bible study portion. And guys get it. It goes right to their phone. They can read it in 90 seconds to two minutes. Mm -hmm. And that grounds the topic in the scriptures, yep. in, in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's Gospel on Tap. We've seen about 150 men come through. Again, they have to sign, like guys have to sign up. You have to be committed. You pay money to be there. Um, but it is life-changing for men. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you know, you can learn more about that at gospelontap.com. Um, we're gearing up for our winter and spring sessions here in the next few weeks. So that's at gospelontap.com. Um, so now hymns and hops. You want to talk about hymns and hops? You got questions about gospel on tap? I have zero questions. Other than when does the next one start? We're working on the date. Now yeah. that I've made that transition, yeah. um, we're working on dates that work best for men, um, and we're looking at scaling. So keep an eye on our on Facebook, Gospel on Tap on Facebook, as well as the website to be able to get some more information about that. So over the course of four years, we've had 150 guys come through. We average about 30 guys per session. So getting a little warm. I'm getting a little, a little warm, toasty. my friend. Um, so we average about uh, 30 guys per session. The next one is going to start sometime in the winter, spring. We're working on dates that are best for guys right now. Having stepped into this full time, um, we're, we're really looking at what works best for men. So yeah, that's Gospel on Tap. Check it out. If you want more information, guys, gospelontap.com or Facebook uh, at Gospel on Tap. Now, hymns and hops. Mm. So hymns and hops is a fun little story. So we, it, when I said we were talking about unconventional ministry and initiatives, like Gospel on Tap, Hymns and Hops. I don't want anyone to think that I'm def like declaring that this is an original concept, sure. right? People have been getting around pubs and drink and community talking about the gospel for years, and they've been doing the same thing with songs. Most of our hymns that we sing this day, today were written in pubs. Like, yep. um, not all of them, not all of them. Save me a few emails. <laughs> a lot of them, though, were written uh, in pubs. So hundreds and hundreds of years ago, before our country were founded, uh, believers in Jesus were gathering in pubs or just local establishments, writing and singing hymns while enjoying gifts of community and drink and song. So across our country, there are several beer and hymns or hymns and hops type situations. Mm -hmm. um, but two years ago, uh, and we'll share the whole story later, but two years ago, I decided to start hymns and hops. Now, the interesting thing about that is I cannot sing and I play no musical instruments. <laughs> And most of those things are what the other groups do, right? They're started by musicians. They're started yeah, by worship leaders. Sense. They're started by music producers, right? I had neither of those things. I just thought, wouldn't it be cool to do hymns and beer, right? Go along yeah. with Gospel and Tap. So the first two people I asked to join me said no. I was like, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but then I started asking other people, and they're like, yeah, we're in. Yeah, we're in. So we started two years ago, December two years ago, with... Uh, we, we counted 81 people at Grateful Brew. And you can go back to our Instagram page, at Hymns and Hops, and watch that first video, and it's really awkward. Because people are like, <laughs> oh, what are we doing here? This is strange. Um, yeah, it was just really different. But there was 81 people there. So like, and they're like, let's do it again. So we did another one, uh, 115 people. Let's do it again, 115 people. And we were doing those on Tuesday nights. Uh, but then we did our first one at 13 Stripes Brewery uh, on a Sunday night. And this was, I think it was June 4th, 2017. And over 350 people showed up. Jeez. And, and here's, here's the thing about Hymns Hop. This is what we do. We sing old hymns, connect in community, and you can drink whatever you want that night. Because like, people, people come to Hymns and Hops, they don't drink. Like they, we, we have kids that come. Mm -hmm. It's just an amazing family gathering. And all we do is sing old hymns. We don't sing modern songs. Not that there's anything wrong with those. Mm -hmm. We just... Pick a church and go listen to those. We don't do cover songs of like 80s rock or 70s. Also, not a problem. <laughs> Just we don't do that. We, we sing old hymns. It's not a cover band. We push people to the front. You can go watch these videos. I'm telling you. We push people to the front. And for two hours, we sing at the top of our lungs. That's awesome. And it's a blast. And after that time, it has just continued to grow, continued to grow. And at our last gathering in October, this past October, um, we saw over 800 people come through the door. People drove two hours hmm. to come to this event. We've, and, and it's really simple because it's not overcomplicated. We sing, we connect to community, and we enjoy good gifts. That's what we do. And we do it about seven times a year in Greenville. Um, but we've had requests from six cities just in South Carolina alone to bring hymns and hops. And several of those, about half of those six, want gospel on tap as well. We've been contacted by three or four different states, like people in different states who are like, please bring this wow. to our area. So we're seeing the growth of these things. And that was part of what just led us to, for Jessica and I to step into this, because we've seen God grow it. And we've seen people's lives change because of it. And yes, it comes with its level of controversy, right? Jesus and beer, Jesus and breweries and sure. bars. And, and, and I get that. And here's, and I wanna be clear on this. Gospel and Tap and Hymns and Hops isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. There are groups of men who shouldn't come and groups of people who should not come to hymns and hops and gospel on tap. 
And I'm not trying to convince you that you should or convince you that it's right, but there is a large group of people that this is connecting with and that this is meeting a need for. So we're gonna keep doing it. Yeah. We're gonna keep going after it. So my big goal, people are like, what, what's your like big goal? I'm like, well, I wanna see this replicated all over the country. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna focus on South Carolina right now, you know, maybe a little into North Carolina and Georgia, you know, within driving distance. But yeah, I wanna see this replicated. Not so that I can go and play on a bunch of stages. I don't play any <laughs> instruments. And not so that I can lead gospel on tap groups because I'm because they're table led. Yeah. I mean, so much of All Good Things is so that is set up, All Good Things is a nonprofit, but so many things about Gospel on Tap and Hymns and Hops is set up in such a way that if I, if I don't make it home tonight because mm. I die in a car accident, you can, they can still go on because yeah. it's not dependent it's on me. It's creating space. It's creating spaces yeah. for intentional, innovative ways to have conversations and celebrations about Jesus and the gospel. Um, in a way that invites cross-generational, that invites cross-denomination, like we're not connected to any one church. Um, so we have, we have all ages, all backgrounds, uh, all ethnicities um, to come together uh, in a unified time at Hymns and Hops and then for guys to come together and realize what's said at Gospel on Tap stays at Gospel on Tap, mm -hmm. for it to be a safe space for them to share and we've just seen the growth of these to the point where when eight weeks ago we, we came to an intersection, a crossroads, it wasn't easy to make the decision, but we knew it was the right decision. Yeah. So tell everybody where they can go to get a hold of you. Because what I know is there's going to be people that are listening to this that are like, man, like this is something that I could get behind. This is right. something that I would love to support. That'd be awesome. Um, how can they find you to have that conversation? Um, uh, and for those that are in the general area, South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, right. they may be one of those locations that yeah. want to open up right. um, and have <clears throat> have these gatherings in, in their towns. Yep. Um, where can they have those conversations? Great question. So you can learn more about Gospel on Tap at gospelontap.com and at Facebook Gospel on Tap, and you can direct message me from either one of those lo locations. Um, Hymns and Hops, check out the Instagram, at Hymns and Hops, Facebook, at Hymns and Hops, and then hymnsandhops.com for more information. And get on your calendar. Next Hymns and Hops is December 9th at Revel Event Center, downtown Greenville. It's a little too cold to be at the brewery in December. <laughs> uh, so we're thankful that Revel's opening up their doors. But if you want to connect with me and just kind of follow along with the journey, um, you can email me at talk at thejonathanrparker.com. Talk at thejonathanrparker.com. You can follow me on um, Facebook at that handle, and then Instagram at the Jonathan R. Parker, and you can just message me through that um, as well. You can give on both websites, but if you just want more information or you just want to talk, uh, shoot me an email uh, uh, at that email address or just connect with me on one of the social media platforms. Love to talk with you. And again, come on in on that Sunday. Drive in December 9th. We're going to start singing at 7. I would get there around 6, uh, and you'll be out the door by 845. That's awesome. I think there's there's so many different things that I think people will actually be able to pull out of this. Um, uh, the main being, obviously, the conversation that you have with your spouse. That whole dynamic, I think, is very powerful because yeah. <clears throat> I think it's very practical for probably what a lot of people are going through or mm -hmm. will go through or have gone through at some point. At some point, no doubt. Like that last time we were together, like, oh, yeah, I like everybody. I like yes, everybody. like that's everybody. <laughs> um, but then also just the... Uh, I think for everybody to just be aware of different opportunities that are around them that yeah. can turn into full-time um, purpose and right. passion. Like, you know, I, you know, you had the vision of what this could turn into, uh, but now, like, this is a reality, right. you know? And I think it's so incredible for something like this that started out as an idea that you had the audacity to pursue right. on the side Mm -hmm. 4 a.m. And mornings. I would say even greater audacity to pursue um, amidst a environment just in church culture where you knew that there would be people that would see it in a positive light and negative light right. and still pursue it because you knew it was right. Mm -hmm. But then grow that into something that now is going to reach thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. Um, it's incredible. And, and being based off of your gifts. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for me is just that you never know if you're focused on your gifts, mm -hmm. you never know where that will take you. Right. But so many people focus on passion, right. 
And passion comes and goes. Right. But if you focus on what you're truly gifted at and, and those God-given gifts that you have, the passion will follow. Exactly. Like the passion will always follow right. if you're operating out of your gifts. Right. Um, and, and that to me is why I have no doubt in whatsoever that this isn't going to be wildly successful because it's a person operating out of their God-given gifts and that will only produce fruit, right? Thanks, I mean, that's, that's, that's it. Uh, but I would love for you guys to support um, in any possible way that you can. Uh, reach out to me. I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions and connect you with Jonathan if you can't. Find him if you got the R, if you got if you forgot the R, R. and Jonathan R. Parker right. or something, and you've messaged some random Jonathan Parker from like yeah, get this guy. Wichita. He can get message in me. Right. I'll get you. I'll get you <laughs> right to him. Uh, but guys, with that, this is episode ninety three. Getting close man. to hundred. Ninety three. Getting close to hundred. We're bringing that wolf on episode hundred. You heard it here first. I think it's great. It's recorded. We're bringing this guy's great great grandson. <laughs> so terrifying. With that, I am your host, Tyler Harris. John the Parker. Thanks, y'all. we are the Sales Wolves. Oh!